Tonight we're going to work through a simple set of thoughts that are meant to encourage you, to move you forward, and cause you to love the Lord just a little bit more than you did before. Now, if you've heard me teach or preach regularly in the last three months, then you have heard me quote a specific passage of Scripture several times. I was quoting it in a different context, but tonight we'll be looking at it and exploring it from a different vantage point. Psalm chapter number 8. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens and the, wor the work of thy fingers, and the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou, hast vi that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Yeah. Pass, the title of tonight's message is, What is Man? What is man? Let's pray. Father, we need you to take us where we need to go tonight. We do not count on our own abilities, both to teach or to hear. We do not count on our own abilities to understand. We trust that your spirit will speak truth to our hearts. Father, we're not wanting to just lay a bunch of more truth into the fallow ground of our mind. But we're asking that this truth would be put deeply enough that it would bring forth fruit and enable us to love you more and conform us to the image of our Savior. For we ask this in his precious and holy name. Amen. Verses 3 and 4 are actually part of the same sentence. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, which thou hast ordained what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? David's writing this, and I don't know how much they understood about the universe. Men of old were intrinsically smarter than us, and I think that they also spent a lot more time in contemplation than we do. Did I turn this thing on, John? I did, okay. But they did not have the advantage of super telescopes and space exploration. But David did look up into the sky, I'm sure, and he saw the sun and the moon and the stars. Think of him as a young shepherd boy in the middle of the night, spending the night out there watching the sheep. I'm guessing that he laid on his back and looked up into the stars and contemplated. He watched the seasons come and go and the perfect unison of the universe being displayed throughout those seasons. And I'm guessing that when he did lay there on his back and look up into the sky at night, I'm guessing he felt very, very small. You know that I like to read about the stars and about the planets. Space exploration is very interesting to me. But when I listen to the massive sizes of some of the stars and the fact that there are a billion, billions actually of galaxies and they estimate that there are a septillion stars and that everything is measured in units that my brain just cannot understand. Yeah. A light year. I realize that this planet is less than a fly speck in the universe, and I am less than a fly speck on this planet, and I feel very, very small. And the question comes to mind, just like it has to yours, what is man? David asks this question, and we are not alone in the asking because Job asked the question twice. In Job 7, he asks, What is man that thou shouldst magnify him, and thou, that thou shouldst set him, and that thou shouldst set thine heart upon him? 
David asked the same question again in Psalm 144. Lord, what is man that thou takest knowledge of him? It is a legitimate question. What is a fly speck on a fly speck in the middle of this ginormous universe? What is man? According to verses 5 through 8, man's position in God's order of things is man is just a little bit lower than the angels, and he's a little bit higher than the animals. And yet, God has crowned him with glory and honor. Man holds a very special place. Even though he is not as powerful as the angels, he has a position of special honor. What is man? What is this position of honor that man has? So let's work through this very quickly tonight, very simply. Uh, seven points of the special honor that man has. Number one, man was made in the image of God. Turn quickly to this. We, it's such a familiar verse, but sometimes it helps us in the familiarity. Genesis chapter number one, sorry, Genesis one. Verse number 26. Keep your finger there in Psalm 8, but in Genesis 1, 26. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. This puts man in a very unique position. And we don't understand all of the meaning of this or the ramifications of it. But of no other part of the creation is this said. So man has a already a, a special spot what is man? Why is he so special? One, because he is made in the image of God. Number two, man is the only part of the Genesis creation that is eternal. Man is the only part of the Genesis creation that is eternal. When God started designing the universe, when he started speaking it into existence, each piece was designed and planned with a purpose. We are walked in Genesis through the six days of creation. And at the end of each day, what did God say? It is good. It is good. It's not like our projects. Can I ask a question, just as an aside? Why is it that whenever I build a, make a project and I make a mistake, it's always right in the center of everything? I have several mistakes that I have made in some construction that I do that I see every single day. It's in a place where I sit, and when I look forward, there's the mistake. Why couldn't it have been behind the closet door? Why couldn't it have been in the other room? Nobody else sees this mistake. So why, if it had been in the other place, nobody would even know about it, except now I see it every single. There's no answer to this question. How many know the, of what I speak? It seems like every time you make a real major mistake, it's right there where you can see it. You know, God didn't have this problem. When he created the earth, he looked at it, and he didn't say, ah, that's not quite the way I wanted it to turn out. He said, that's really good. He didn't say, oh, well, it's, we're going to tear this out in 10 years anyway. Anybody ever say that? <laughs> this is only temporary, so it's okay. So I did a lot. That's what you tell your wife when, when you make a mistake. It's only temporary. We're going to remodel the whole house later on down the road. He didn't say that. He didn't have to say that. Even though, you know, every, everything he made, he knew was slated for destruction. Everything that he was making, he knew was temporary. He already knew that the heavens would be, uh, the, the heavens would, uh, I'm trying to think of the words here, would pass away and the elements would burn up with a fervent heat. Only one small piece of creation would make the cut. 
Only one small piece of creation would be eternal. And that's man. With man, God breathed into man the breath of life. And man became a living soul. God, man's life was linked with God's life. And as long as God exists, so will we. So man has this special position. We're created in his image, but we're the only part of the Genesis creation that is eternal. Number three. Man is the only part of creation with a choice. He's the only part of creation with a choice. We do not have all the information about the angels. It does seem that they at one time had a choice. Some chose, chose God, some chose to revolt. But if, from what we can understand, the window of this opportunity to choose was a very narrow window. And once it was made, it was no longer an option. This is why we have angels and demons. There was a one-time choice, it seems, in there somehow. The rest of creation has no choice. The sun, the moon, and the stars follow the courses that God set. The rocks, the trees, the rivers do what God made them to do. The animal kingdom is no different. Do you know what the word personification means? Back from your old English high school days. Personification is a very popular thing for us to do. Personification means to give human qualities to animals. That's what personification is. And it's a very popular thing to do. Stemming, it, it varies from, if you ever go to flea markets, you'll see a velvet, you have velvet Elvises, you remember the velvet Elvises? But next to the velvet Elvis, They'll have a velvet poker table. And what's sitting at the poker table? Dogs playing poker. Okay. <laughs> That's a very familiar thing at flea markets. It stems from that. It goes clear through uh, George Orwell's Animal Farm. And almost every Disney movie is personification. And it goes into the way that we actually treat our pets. But the fact of the matter is, animals simply do what God created them to do. Sure, you can train an elephant to ride a bicycle. They do that in the circus. Why does he ride that bicycle? Because in his mind, it's associated with the food that he has to eat, with the treats that it gave him to get him to do that. Look, you never have to go to the Walmart toy department and have to wait in line because all the animals from the circus are there wanting to buy a new bicycle to go on a trip. They ride the bicycle because they train them to do it with food, which is what God created them to do. They find food, they eat. Animals do what God told them to do. From the single-celled organism to the star that is so large that it pushes the boundaries of our comprehension, everything that God made does exactly what he made it for, except for man. Man was given a choice. That puts man in a special spot. He was made in the image of God. He's the only part of the Genesis creation that's eternal. He is the only part of creation that has a choice. Number four, he has the ability to behave like an animal or a devil. He has the ability to behave like an animal or a devil. This is a very interesting con characteristic. When you think about choices, normally when you give your kids a choice, there are parameters to it, right? There's the, you can go, you can choose anything from here to here. What are the lower limits of man's ability to choose? Well, I don't know, but I've been watching it for 50 years, and I've been reading a lot of history, and it doesn't seem like there's any, any limit to the bottom of where man will go. The way that man acts and the things that he chooses to do are almost unbelievable. In history, you'll find men acting no better than savage animals, killing each other simply for the sport of it, or to gain whatever they can get from killing somebody. Man's perverseness can be so shocking that it cannot even be spoken of in polite society. 
Man's evil knows no bounds. In fact, sometimes in the shadows, sometimes actually out in the open, men unite themselves with the powers of darkness, the sworn enemy of their creator. And men will stoop to that level. Men men have the ability to behave like animals or devils. It's a special position that they have. But contrast that to number five. Men can worship with angels. Men can worship with angels. Tozer says, if you would put an angel and an animal, I think he used an anim- the gorilla, but I'm not for sure. If you put an angel and an animal in a room together, there will be no communion between the two. Because there's no likeness of nature there. There's nothing in common that they have, and so there'll be no communion between the angel and the animal. But with man, we just showed they can act and commune with animals and have fellowship in that level. But if we read through the scriptures, we find often that men interacted with angels. And in the book of uh, Revelation, chapter number 4 and 5, in those magnificent pictures of heaven, what do we find men doing there? Worshiping with angels worshiping God. This is an upper limit that is almost unbelievable. His lower limit where he can take himself into the depths is almost, is, seems limitless. But the height to which he is allowed to go is also almost unbelievable. What an honor, what a privilege. His lower limits have no boundaries seemingly, but neither do his upper limits. What makes man special? He's made in the image of God. He's the only part of the genus creation that is eternal. He's the only part of creation with a choice. He has the ability to behave like an animal or a devil. He has the ability to worship with angels. Number six, it was a man that God chose to become. It was a man that God chose to become. The incarnation incarnation is difficult to understand on a lot of levels. But the why of it is the most difficult. But no matter how we choose to answer those questions, the fact still remains, God became a man. In fact, Jesus is the eternal God-man. In fact, the passage that we read here in Psalm chapter number 8 is actually a a prophecy of Jesus Christ according to Hebrews chapter number 2. God did not choose to become some species of an animal, nor did he choose to become an angel. But he did forever link himself to the human race. If that's not special, I don't know what is. And lastly, number seven tonight, he is not ashamed to call us brethren. What makes man special? The fact that God is not ashamed to call us brethren. Our passage in Hebrews 2 tells us this. Have you ever been ashamed to admit that you know somebody? Or that you're related to somebody? Or that you're with somebody? Right now, painful memories are running through your mind. This person that you're with says something stupid or does something stupid, or does something that is just, is just not proper in the situation, and you're like, I don't know those people. I wonder who they are. I wonder where they came from. And you just totally ignore them and act like they are not somebody that you know. Would you blame God if he acted like he didn't know you about half the time? If he looked at you and says, how stupid can one person get? I don't know that person. If he looked at what, listened to what you said, if he watched what you did, the choices that you made, the situations that you get yourself into, the unbelievable messes that you make, if he just hid his face and walked away and distanced himself from us, 
that would be justice. It would be exactly what we deserve. You know what's the shocking thing? The exact opposite of what's actually true. It's us who act like we don't know him. We get into some situation and it doesn't look like God is popular. Being spiritual is popular. And so we just kind of back into the shadows like, I don't know anything what you're talking about. We're ashamed to call him father or brother. We distance ourselves from him. But he does not do that to us. This is a shocking thing. He is not ashamed to call us brethren. Fickle, stupid, unfaithful, disobedient, and a thousand other negative adjectives that we could use about ourselves. And he is not ashamed to call us brethren. What a special place to be. What is man? He seems so insignificant. You lay there looking up at the sky and you say, why would you take any thought of us, me at all? I'm a fly speck on a fly speck. And that is true. God has crowned us with glory and honor. He made us in his image. He made us eternal. He gave us a choice. He didn't put any limit to our lower limits. He didn't put any limits to our upper limits of our behavior. He chose to take on human flesh, and he's not ashamed to call us brethren. The truth of the matter is we are insignificant little nothings on a nothing planet. But God has chosen to put us in a favored spot. Now, if you will contemplate that, what it will do for you is this. It will cause you to love him for this gift. He could have treated us like the insignificant nothings that we are. But he has given us these, this special spot. He's put us in this special spot. It is a gift. He's crowned us with glory and honor. It's a special spot. And when we recognize that, it will cause us to work toward the purpose for which these gifts were bestowed. We would use these choices that we have, the ability to choose on his behalf. We would link ourselves more closely with him. We would act the way he desires us to act. What is man? Let's pray.